What's up YouTube? I am back and I just want to apologise first and foremost for not uploading yesterday on Boxing Day. I came down with a random 24 hour bug. It's been going around for a little bit and I'm just really glad I haven't been sick yet. Um, still not necessarily feeling 100% hence why I'm not wearing that much makeup. So forgive me for my ugliness without the makeup. But for today's video I want to do something a little bit different compared to the last two videos which I did. One which was the project playlist tag and the other one which is the guess the song game. But I thought I'd go and do a video which I've been wanting to do for a while and is very similar to the content that I used to uh, create back when I first started YouTube which well, didn't necessarily have any reason to be uh, recorded but I just wanted to address this certain topic. Now for most of you who already know about the golf subculture and like this you'll be watching this video and kind of think what's he talking about? It's like obviously that there's no correlation between um, these genres, as you can probably tell from the title right now, but I thought that I might as well just dibble dabble into the different uh, misconceptions between shock rock and goth rock. Now, before I start anything, I'm not saying that shock rock is unnecessary or that it is important, especially when it comes to blueprints of the goth rock genre, because obviously that is not true. And anyone that knows their history about the construction of goth as a you know, repertoire will know that. Early shock rock had a massive influence on the blueprint of what goth rock was become as far as theatrics go and certain little subclauses within the overall construction of the music. So let's just start on a little brief history about shock rock, just a very, very, very quick analysis of what shock rock is. So shock rock was created roughly around in the 1950s, starting off the US and then adapting into the UK scene. And I'd say that it predominantly got a lot more recognition during the early 70s. The first quote-unquote shock rock song has always been credited to the 1956 Screaming Jay Hawkins song, I Put a Spell on You. Um, you'll find with a lot of videos analysing proto-golf, and especially how golf became golf before the title, they're normally credited to this song, which you'll understand not only from a lyrical connotation, and just the overall decoding of the song, how Screaming Jay Hawkins A wrote it as well as sang it, you also have to look at the theatrics over it. So with shock rock in particular, a lot of the conventions of shock rock is it follows a rock or metal repertoire, but it relies predominantly on the aesthetics of shock um, theatrical performances. So basically the theatrical side of the performance emphasizes the value and title of the genre. And this can range to a lot of things such as like gore, stage props, just overall provocation, basically anything to get a neg negative reaction of what we would say was provoking or shocking in many aspects. So if we're going to go through Screaming Jay Hawkins to, for example, he was very synonymously known of starting off his show in a coffin, he was had the bone going through his nose, it's obviously like a very voodoo witch doctor type of vibe about it. And for the 1950s, especially in the 60s, this is kind of seen very unconventional. This is not something that people have many seen before, and it was quite shocking, as you expect, which also kind of matches his music. But also, going into the UK scene as well, where it equally got recognition, we're going to be talking about artists such as Arthur Brown, who became very predominant in the 1960s. His 1968 song, Fire, is always been considered a very psychedelic take on shock rock. Especially when you watch a music video you can tell that during the 60s this was a very prog rocky type of band and, and very psychedelic influenced but the overall theme of it as well as the local connotations and the way how he presented himself was clear indication of provocation and became the one of the founding members of British shock rock. But his acts like this will end up influencing mass artists through the 1970s who made a living of theatricality and provocation. So let's start off with the rock and metal scene. So we obviously have Alice Cooper who has been very credited with Domi a lot as a very proto-goth influencer. As much as he isn't a goth himself, a lot of his theatrical makeup was very um, inspirational to a lot of modern day goths. So we see a lot of people dressed up in Alice Cooper makeup and you also get this type of misconception just because that he created or established the foundation of American shock rock in the 70s which became a lot more uh, controversial, a lot more um, eye-dropping, shall we say, more than Scream J. Hawkins. There was this mass uh, correlation, confusion of Alice Cooper being affiliated with golf. Now, anyone that knows gothic rock, it's not exactly that easy cut. So we all know that goth rock established through the post-punk movement. So we all know that 
goth came from the post-punk movement as well as a lot of the glam movement as well and having this hard rock genre music but only establishing the quote-unquote similarities through aesthetic reasons not through repertorial reasons is a very thin and vague um, conversement. But it even just didn't even stop at rock to be fair, we also had it within the punk scene as well, predominantly in American punk scene as well. As much as the British punk bands, like our stereotypical ones that we all know, they would provocate and cause controversy through the lyrical meanings, especially through conservative governments, whilst you have bands like the Plasmatics, who are very much all about the aesthetics, about um, starting with fights, using chainsaws, cutting up televisions, cutting up guitars. It was very much a whole, wow, look at this. Wendy, Wendy Williams is a very prime example about this, especially for the way how she would have dressed back then. Very provocative, very revealing, and very explicit in many senses. And obviously during a time where you used to have a lot of controversy about this stuff, it was obviously plain to shock. And if we're going to go to a certain extent on, this, on the male spectrum, you can also include Gigi Allen on this, because there's no way that someone can deny that, as much as he was a punk musician, that his way of performing live wasn't an indication to shock and to cause mass controversy, mass discomfort, and mass anxiety in the very way. I mean, this is, this is coming from a guy that used to not only just make himself bleed on stage, not only just he would um, throw his own excrement onto his fans or smear on himself, but he would actually pick fights with his fan base and to certain aspects which I've read and denounced this is true, but judging by the um, charges against him, but he would also, to many extent, um, try to sexually assault a lot of his uh, fan base, but in the indication of shock, which I think to me is the constant the umbrella term of shock rock taken to the very, very extreme and unneeded level. But even to this day, even when we look in bands from the early 2000s and even the early 90s, but we also got bands like Gua and Lordy who use this whole theatrical monster-ish type of like, vision to create this type of shock-juiced um, theatrical shows. It's because of the way how they dress and not only if you've ever been to a Gua show you would know that a lot of the theatrics are very much blood, 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 killing Nazis, all this type of stuff and it's one hell of a show to go and see. Same with Lordy, I remember the first time I saw them, which was on Eurovision back in 2006, and they were the epitome of what I thought shock rock was back then, because it's something that people didn't know, they didn't know how to classify per se, but they fit so well within that type of tongue-in-cheek, um, monster heavy metal theme, and if, that's, if their indication isn't a shock and tell a story through their monster, uh, theme, then I don't know what is. But even when we get to certain shock artists, especially shock metal acts, who incorporate that type of gothic-y type of look, this is where misca misconceptions can lie. So obviously Rammstein I've seen have been labelled as gothic metal, even though theoretically it's more industrial metal, but a lot of their stage provocations and pyrotechnics definitely fall underneath the shock rock label. Especially following a lot of controversies that Rammstein would have, not only just through local content, but also through uh, their own stage performances as well. Another big misconception obviously is Rob Zombie and Marilyn Manson, which I'm going to get into a little bit later. However, I do want to clarify one little thing. This is not to confuse with horror punk, which is obviously a subgenre through punk music in the 70s that's incorporated the tongue-in-cheek theatrical styles of B-side movies and shock rock, aka proto-goth elements. But obviously there's also this big confusion about how when you look between the fine lines of with them being punk and goth being very affiliated to punk, especially post-punk, why can't more they being entwined? As I said, it all comes down through the relation of the timeline, because you have to remember horror punk, just if I can remember correctly, stands more from the American scene of punk more than the British form of punk. And through horror punk, you will have these certain connections which obviously do relate to a lot, such as the 4x4 time signature and fast guitaring, but that's more in common with traditional punk than it is with slow-tempoed goth music, which has very eerie guitar effects. And you also have to look at the theatrical and lyrical connotations as well, where goth music and goth lyrics are more influenced through novellas and uh, dark fantasy, whilst with horror punk, it is very much tongue-in-cheek B-movie type of references. There is a distinguish between them. Even their makeup's a lot different. I mean, if you look at the Misfits, for example, and then compare it to, say, any other type of goth rock band like Alien Sex Fiend, it's two different types of style of makeup. 
One's very cartoonish, one is more ghoulish. That's the best way how I try to very quickly sum this up. Before I start getting the comments about the affiliation with Death Rock, some people kind of forget that as much as Death Rock is extremely affiliated with the gothic subculture, and as much as it takes a lot of influence through gothic aesthetics and gothic influences, you have to remember that Death Rock is predominantly a punk sub-genre, not a goth sub-genre. Because Death Rock was basically the closest thing that the Americans had to their version of golf, which took its influence a lot from American punk at that time, and a lot through horror punk as well. But as well as gothic imagery, it also took a lot of the horror theme that horror punk would incorporate. So this is why with Death Rock, as much as we are very open accepting to it, and as much as many goths do love horror punk, because it has a very similar theatrical influence about it, you have to see that obviously you have the American punk scene, which is where horror punk came from, and that's where Death Rock affiliated from. And obviously with the British, you had the post-punk, and then you had the goth rock, and then you had a little bit of a crossbreed genre, which I always call death punk, which is the closest that anyone can ever call alien sex theme, because they weren't exactly goth, but they weren't exactly punk. They were kind of in twine in the middle. And this is where I come to the part where we have these connections, where they occasionally connect and work together. As I said, just because shock rock started off within the blues, the rock and the metal and even the punk doesn't necessarily mean that it can't converge with golf. As mentioned at the beginning of this video that shock rock, the, the blueprints of shock rock, helped influence a lot of what we see within the gothic blueprint now, especially when it comes to aesthetics. Every time you go to a golf show it's always this type of smoke fog, dark blue lit lighting, you have these type of candles, very gothic -y -esque, almost like a noir film that you're watching and it's bits like that which were taken a lot through the early influences of shock rock. So as I mentioned about alien sex fiends I've always counted them not exactly punk and not exactly goth but somewhere in the middle where punk and like the b-side type of cliche of horror punk kind of emerged so to me I always call them more or less um, the British version of death rock which is to me death punk and even Ross Williams had it that type of shock rockiness to Christian Death, even though that it was death rock as a genre, but you see a lot of the shock rock influences. If you look at Ros Williams, obviously, not only was the whole bridal androgynous dress and the burning crosses and everything like that, but Ros Williams used to parade himself in Nazi uh, paraphernalia as well, which obviously caused a hell of a lot of controversy for him during his time. But to understand the, the mind how Ros Williams work, it's not as simple as that, and I strongly suggest you looking into the book of Ros Williams, which is a fantastic book, and it goes to explain a lot about why he chose a lot of these type of very, very controversial um, appearances. But it worked in his favour. Christian Death of Ros Williams became a very shock rocky type of band, and it drew that very androgynous, melancholic flair about shock rock which came through death rock. But we should also remember the concepts as well. Shock rock theatrics are based on the sense and concept of making the audience shocked or disturbed through lyrical or physical methods. So obviously when you're going to a shock rock show it's either going to be something like of the metal genre or the rock genre. Let's take Alice Cooper as a, as a case study. A lot of the theme is going to be rock. It's very rock driven um, guitars, structure, repertoire melody, all that type of stuff, but the appearance of it, and this is why I always thought that when it comes to bands, if you're going to be a rock band, at least and make it look like you are a rock band. The amount of times that I've seen bands nowadays just wearing shirts and t-shirts, like just walked up the street, it doesn't scream the indication, the artistic side of music. And to me, music, just like art, is extremely important as a combination. So uh, this is why I always appreciate bands that go the extra way to put a good show on. People might find it gimmicky, but I think if you're going to be a rock star, act like a rock star. So when it comes to shock rock, because especially with Alice Cooper, it goes through a story. He goes through his many stories, and the whole guillotine execution, bringing back to the dead on the Freeman Frankenstein stuff, but it's stuff that people love to watch over and over again. But when he first brought it in back in the late 60s, early 70s, it was something that people were not expecting, it really made them discomfort. A lot of them thought they were going to a snuff concert. And it's something like that, that people ended up having a love for. It's a bit, it's a little bit like you stress actually, where you have this type of comfort in the discomfort. But as I said, to make this type of comparison where shock rock uses a lot of the shocking themes and 
um, performances to back up the music. Whilst you'll find with gothic theatrics are used more in the background theme of their shows, having more neutral stands and not as provocatively in your face as shock rock. As goth theatrics can be sexy and sardonic, shock rock brings the essence of fictional storytelling through negative emotions such as disgust, anger and fear to provoke. But however, at the same time, death rock bands will use the same meanings to provoke in their sets, which can lead to mild confusion or crossovers of themes. So as we can establish the connection as well as the differences through this, now let's move on to as to where the main confusion lies. So let's break it down. Let me use a couple of examples. Let's start with the most obvious one makeup. Just because a band wears makeup, like Pale Foundation and Black Eyeshadow, doesn't mean it's classified as goth. There are many variations of makeup styles. You wouldn't necessarily count, say, Alice Cooper's makeup to, say, corpse paint of black metal, for example, or the theatrics of early Bauhaus to Dimo Borgia, for example. So different styles have got different symbolisms and different denotations. So let's look at, for example, as I mentioned, like the trad goth scene, the early goth stuff was very vampiric influence. So let's look at Dave Vanian and look, let's look at Peter Murphy, for example, where it was very much a white face, trying to look like a corpse or a vampire as close as you can through the connections and references in the lyrics. Then when you compare to say, um, let's say Marilyn Manson, the most common misconception between goth and shock rock. As much as Manson, as we all know, isn't a goth in the sense of that his music is gothic per se, apart from Eat Me Dream Me, that's the closest he's ever got to goth repertoires, but the way how he dresses and the way how he appears himself, it's how people would see as goths, especially in the late 90s to the early 2000s where the whole mole goth imagery kind of came along, and that's how you had such a big influence and big rise within the more goth scene relating to the um, noughties era of gothic music. Very much how like industrial became so synonymous with the gothic substance through Nine Inch Nails. That said, it's the use of gothic anaesthetics that gets this misconception going on. As I said, Saga like Ramstein, people call them gothics the way how they dress, even though it's not necessarily that case, it's more just a case of how it suits the music. But Ramshan's makeup has changed throughout so many years for the career that they haven't stuck to a single original like look. Whilst you find with bands like Alice Cooper from the shock rock theme that he always has his very iconic makeup. Same with Manson to an extent, but at the same time they're completely different to say gothic ideas. And let's get to the second point that the majority of the demographics connect with the visuals. So as I said, even though goth bands or extreme goth bands and death rock bands will use certain cobweb imagery and this type of skeletons on stage, a very good example is the British band Vince Rip and the Rodent Show, who, which were a side project of Ellen Sexfiend. I've seen them many times and they're a fantastic band and I always got strong death rock vibes from it. So this whole um, tongue-in-cheek type of facade is very horror punk influence as well but obviously going to a show it's there to provoke it's there to send you on this trip of discomfort so you'll find through demographics as well that people will look at stuff like that and just have the closest affiliation which is goth because you can't necessarily say that it's all metal because not all metal um, artists wear makeup but the majority of goth artists do wear goth makeup and this is where especially with age demographics it kind of becomes a big thing, hence was so about the 90s and the noughties era where you had lots of more artists dressing theatrical, dressing more um, dark in their aesthetics, so people are going to assume that that's what goth is or that's the new evolution of goth. The stage shows for goth and shock, it's similar in context but it's different in execution. So as I said, with a lot of goth bands, you have this type of romantic facade about it with the roses, the candles, the cobwebs even, to give you that sense of journey that you're reading a like a penny dreadful type of novel, like you're reading an old novella. Whilst with shock rock, it's a case of you going through a horror story. That's basically the difference how I can relate to when you're going through a novella and then you're watching a slasher movie. That's a very close comparison how the execution is different in the performances. And as I said before, the other difference is that shock rock is mainly seen as a proto-goth influence, which is heavily regarded and respected in the theatrics of gothic rock and gothic stage performances. But saying that, gothic rock as itself has took a whole completely different direction. So as any examples of differences that we mentioned, we mentioned that the makeup is different, that the sound is different as it's more of a 
rock and metal repertoire compared to a post-punk repertoire. Even the lyrical content is di different through the lyrical analysis if you're going to really nitpick on certain examples. That, like compare the likes of Wednesday 13 to a band such as Virgin Prunes for example. I think the only correlation that you'll probably get is with bands like Simar Strange where they have a very tongue-in-cheek approach but keep very loyal to the death rock and goth rock um, sound. And obviously we mentioned through the misconceptions the examples of misconceptions, so we're talking about bands who use gothic imagery and obviously have no clear um, following of the, the traditional repertoire such as the high bass riffs, the screechy eerie feel guitar effects, the dark sardonic brooding tones of it, the slow tempo, the drum machines, but it's been replaced more with like a very uh, modern metal sound for example and just a very quick example to think the top of my head where let's use Motionless and White for example they are a metal band a metalcore band going into industrial phase but they're using this whole type of shock rock look that they were inspired by Manson and this is where a lot of this confusion of them being labeled as gothic come from and sorry for the little rants but I just thought that I'll just clarify this and I haven't done a video like this in ages hopefully you enjoyed that let me know what you think of the video and I will see you in the new year. Let's end 2019 with a bang and let's welcome 2020. See you all very soon.